Ora, ditemi la verità, no? Cioè, non avevo un compito semplice, perché io parlo dove, do, dopo Stephen Hawking e, e introduco adesso un premio Nobel, no? Cioè, è come cantare a un grande concerto tra, tra Bruce Springsteen e Bruce Springsteen. Cioè, io che sono il cantante locale, no? che, che canticchia tre canzoni, vabbè, ok, fine della storia. Bene, vi voglio introdurre al primo grande ospite di questa sera, che è il professor Takaki Kajita. Takaki Kajita è stato insignito del premio Nobel per la fisica nel 2015, eh, insieme ad Arthur MacDonald perché ha rivelato un fenomeno che si chiama oscillazione dei neutrini e rivelando l'oscillazione dei neutrini ha dimostrato che i neutrini hanno una massa. Ora, i neutrini sono bestie particolari. È come se, immaginatevi eh, l'uomo di Neanderthal, l'uomo sapiens e l'uomo erectus, ok? Sono tre specie diverse di un'unica famiglia, la famiglia degli ominidi. Solo che Homo sapiens è Homo sapiens, è Homo di Neanderthal è Homo di Neanderthal, è Homo erectus è Homo erectus. I neutrini no, anche loro sono in tre famiglie diverse, eh, ma mutano fra loro. Sono in un certo senso uno e trino, e questo mi ricorda qualcosa. Io volevo chiamare sul palco Takaki Kajita. the center to the forward. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the introduction and good evening. Well, as the first talk on the messengers of the universe, I'm going to talk about neutrinos. Now, to, to begin this talk, I want to show this slide. Um, this is a diary written by Fujiwara Teika. And, well, actually, this is about 1,000 years ago. And in one of the pages, he wrote down some very spectacular event that occurred in the universe. Well, to be honest, I cannot read. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> according to the people who can read, <laughs> um, the yellow part is the description of the very bright new star that emerged on May 1st, 1006. And the green part is another description of a bright new star that happened in May 1054. So, clearly, um, these descriptions um, tells us that people have interested in the events that occurred in the universe. And, well, in the present day world, these very bright new stars are supernova. Now, because I'm going to talk about neutrinos, um, I want to talk about a little bit about the uh, uh, key features of neutrinos. First, um, neutrinos are fundamental particles like electrons and quarks. And, well, Of course, you want to know a little bit more. Then, <laughs> neutrinos are something like electrons without electric charge. In fact, this feature 
has a very special consequence. Neutrinos can easily pass through even the earth or even the, even the sun. So, neutrinos can easily pass through stars. And in fact, this feature is very important because neutrinos can bring information of the fundamental processes at the center of the stars. So because of this feature, we think neutrinos are one of, one of the key players in the multi-messenger astronomy. OK, now I want to show you the neutrino detector. Um, this is the Kamiokande experiment. Um, this experiment was operated in the 1980s and 1990s. And this is a large water detector located deep in underground. And in fact, this detector contained 3,000 tons of very pure water. And I want to show you another example. Um, this is another large water detector called IMB. Um, this was actually bigger than Kamiokande. It had 8,000 tons of pure water inside this detector. Again, this detector was located deep underground in United States. By the way, these detectors were constructed to observe proton decays, not to observe neutrinos. In fact, in the 1970s, new theories emerged, and these theories predicted that protons should decay with the lifetime of about 10 to 30 years. Well, 10 to 30 years is an extremely long lifetime. Well, even if protons do not decay or do decay, our daily life doesn't change. But scientifically, this prediction was extremely important. And therefore, people constructed these kind of detectors to observe proton decays. Unfortunately, proton lifetime was longer than predicted. So these experiments never observed proton decays. However, a lucky thing happened. Well, let me tell you, um, this is the explanation of the life of the stars. Um, okay. Um, stars like this, this, our sun, the, um, total life of the sun is about 10 billion years. And if the mass of the star is smaller than the sun, then these, oh, sorry, uh, these stars have an extremely long lifetime. But if the mass of the star is heavier than the sun, then these stars have a dramatic life. They have shorter lifetime, but at the end of the uh, lifetime, they have the uh, very significant explosion. This is called the supernova. And after the supernova, T 
typically neutron star is generated. Or the mass of the star is more heavy, more, much heavier than the um, than sun, then the life is even shorter, and they have the uh, supernova, and at the end, maybe black hole is formed. So this was the thought, um, well, I would say, people expected that supernova was the um, event that occurred at the end of the life of a heavy star, but we didn't have proof. Now, in 1987, in February, um, there was a very bright new star observed in large Magellanic cloud. That is the uh, uh, nearby galaxy next to our Milky Way galaxy. So um, this star exploded, and after the explosion, the star was like that. So this was the uh, supernova explosion. And as I said, at that time, two proton decay experiments, Kamio Kande and IMB, were in operation. Oh, by the way, I have to say, According to the theory of the supernova explosion, 10 to 58 neutrinos should be emitted in about 10 seconds. This is really a huge number. Huge number of neutrinos should be um, emitted in 10, in 10 seconds. Therefore, the neutrino detectors on the Earth could observe these neutrinos. And in fact, the IMB experiment and Kamiokande experiment, and furthermore, the Russian um, Baksan experiment observed neutrinos related to the uh, supernova explosion. And with, with these detectors, a total of about 20 neutrinos were observed, only 20. However, these 20 neutrinos were enough to prove the basic understanding of the mechanism of the supernova explosion. So we understood that supernova occurs at the end of the heavy, uh, at at the end of the heavy star's life, um, at the end of the heavy star's life, all of the uh, um, fusion processes finish, and then the star collapses. And then at the center of the star, neutron star is formed, and then all the materials are bounced and this way, the supernova explosion occurs. So we had only 20 events, but this was really enough to understand the basic mechanism of the supernova explosion. And because of this observation, Professor Koshiba received the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2002. By the way, and he was my thesis advisor. <laughs> so actually, we are very happy uh, to hear this news. <coughs> well, I wanted to show you a video, but um, unfortunately, we have some trouble. Therefore, I cannot show you the video. But <laughs> with this video, <laughs> I wanted to tell you um, the um, say, 
the activities of the people who would like to reproduce this supernova explosion. Actually, in the 1980s, people thought that people, they are able to reproduce the supernova explosion by the computer simulation. Uh, by the way, you know the sun, and you know that the sun is a very good ball, or very good spherical shape. Therefore, initially, people thought that they can reproduce the supernova explosion by, the com by a computer simulation, assuming the complete spherical symmetry, complete ball. However, they were unable to reproduce or simulate the uh, supernova explosion. Therefore, in recent years, people tried to simulate the supernova explosion by a full three-dimensional um, simulation. And in fact, this video wanted to show you the result of the full three-dimensional simulation. And in fact, <laughs> well, this would show you how complicated the supernova explosion is. But anyway, I have to give up. <laughs> anyway, because of the uh, um, so dramatic observation of the supernova neutrino uh, detection, um, we had the next generation neutrino detector it is Super Kamio Kande. It is a 50,000 water detector. So this is approximately one order of magnitude bigger than the previous generation detectors. And well, in fact, this detector is famous because of the uh, um, discovery of the neutrino oscillations that shows that neutrinos have small mass. But unfortunately today, we are talking about the messengers of the universe. So I'm going to stick on the uh, um, supernova neutrinos. Um, by the way, this is another view of the super Kamiokan detector. Here we take a photo from the top of the detector viewing the, um, uh, the downward, and you can see the water. And we have been waiting, waiting, waiting for the next supernova explosion. Well, we have been waiting for more than 20 years, but unfortunately, uh, Super Kamio Kande so far was unable to observe um, supernova neutrino events. So finally, people decided to show you how the supernova neutrino detection could look like in Super Kamio Kande. <laughs> so in this case, uh, I hope. Okay. So this is the detector. Now super well, and neutrinos will be arriving in one second. So this is the signal we would expect for a supernova explosion. And in about 10 seconds, all the neutrinos are gone. So this is the signal we would expect for the supernova explosion. And in fact, the real signal should be even more dramatic because Super Kamio Kande will detect about 10,000 neutrino events in 10 seconds. So this would be a really a, a fantastic information to know the detail of the supernova explosion. So 
super cameo candy is still waiting for the next supernova explosion. Uh, by the way, um, we are now in the multi-messenger astronomy era. And now, in addition to neutrinos, we have gravitational wave detectors. And we are going to hear more about gravitational wave uh, detectors soon. But anyway, if a supernova explosion occurs in our galaxy, then both gravitational wave detectors and neutrino detectors should observe the signal. And by combining these two data, we think we really understand the supernova mechanism of the supernova explosion. And then, soon after, this supernova could also be observed by gamma rays, that means by CTA. And therefore, this way, we expect that we understand the particle acceleration in supernova. So, in the multi-messenger astronomy era, neutrinos, gravitational waves, and gamma rays are going to be very important. Okay, that's all from me. <laughs>